In about four minutes, I'll be starting Skynet. This is N5BB, Net Control. This is the W5FC repeater, PL110.9. Afterglow Movie Net, Saturday, 10.30 p.m., W5FC. Mr. Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet.
Skynet, please stand by. This is in 5 BB, net control. You have a technical issue. Skynet, please stand by. We have a technical issue we're trying to resolve in 5 BB. Okay, we believe the technical issue is resolved. Uh, does anybody need to use the frequency before we start Skydet? This is in 5 BB, that control. This is in 5 BB, November 5, Bravo, Bravo. My name is Bill. I'll be your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy in space. Think, I know, I'm on it. <laughs> I'm sorry, my phone started auto-dialing somebody. Um, Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning subject of astronomy in space. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations um, with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign break break and your call sign. Is there any emergency or party traffic at this time? This is a direct cadet. Please do not transmit without direction from net control. That would be me in 5BB. And stations are reminded to identify the end of your transmissions. Weekly net operates on 146.88 megahertz with PL tone of 110.9. Check-ins via echo link are possible using W5FC-R station ID or echo link node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio and video links are available online. Go to www w.w5fc.org right now for the complete list. Remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur radio operators are welcome. You do not need to be a member of any particular amateur radio club to participate. 
The net is 90 minutes long, structured in several parts. General announcements. Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas. National Space Society. Discussion topic of the evening by Net Control. What's up? Space exploration and space history. Constellation of the week. Space launches this week. Recent astronomical discoveries. Visible satellite passages over the next couple of days. And if we have time, questions and answers about astronomy. Followed by the 73 uh, round. All amateurs licensed to transmit its frequency are invited to check in. Let's start with uh, short-time check-ins. Do we have any short-time check-ins? If so, please come down with your call sign, your name, and your location. This is N5BB, Skynet. Whiskey 9, Victor Papa Uniform, Sam and Allen, Texas, short time. Kilo India 5, my Bravo officer, James, I will talk to Okay, I, first I got WF9, Victor, Papa Uniform, Sam, is that correct? Affirmative, sir, that would be correct. W9, you Thanks, Sam. Then I got James KI5MBO, Mike Bravo Oscar. Is that correct, James? Yes, sir. Okay, you're breaking up badly there, James. You must be mobile or something, or you're moving an antenna around. I guess it's okay. Um... Do either of you have anything you need to ask or comment on the net since you're short time before we you leave? If so, please come now with any questions or comments you have. N5BB Net Control. Very good. Are there any other short time check-ins? Okay, now let's go with general RF check-ins. We'll do Echo Link later, and I'm, I'm watching Echo Link so I can see it. So, uh, please, um, if, uh, the, if you want to check in on RF, it's a time to do it right now. General RF check-ins. Come down with your name, or, your, or I should say your call sign, your name, and your location. Call sign, name, and location. This is in BB. Skynet. Whiskey 5, Bacon, Lettuce, Tomato, W5BLT, Bill Garland. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. You will echo 5, India Charlie X-Ray, Tom Lusso. This is Alpha Golf Niner Sierra Golf, Antonio in Dallas. Kilo Foxtrot 5, Juliet Hotel Alpha, Chaz, Milky Way, more precise, Mesquite, Texas. Okay, we're going a little slow here, but I recognize Bill, W5BLT, Tony, NT5TM, Tom, KE5ICX. Thanks for your technical help, Tom. That was appreciated. Antonio, KG9SG, and Chaz, KF5JHA. Do we have any other RF check-ins? I'll get to Echo Link later. This is N5BB, Skynet. This is Whiskey 5 Golf Uniform Sierra Gus, far, far northeast Dallas. This is Kilo Golf 5 Whiskey Victor Lima, James and Carrollton.
Well, we picked up two more. Hello, Gus, W5GUS. And also recognize James, KG5WVL. Before I move on to Echolink, are there any other RF check-ins for Skynet? This is N5BB. Kilo, India 5, Uniform, Alpha Uniform, David, in the seat. Okay, David, uh, confirm I've got your call right. Is it Kilo India 5 Uniform Alpha Uniform? Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, that's what I heard. Thank you very much, David. Okay, before I move on, any other RF check-ins? This is N5BB, Skynet. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo Lima, Bill Farmer's Branch. This is Alpha Alpha 5, Alpha Hotel, Robert Richardson. Okay, I recognize Bill, KF5ZBL, and Robert, AA5AH. Do we have any other RF check-ins? This is N5BB, Skynet. This is... Whiskey Bravo, number four, Mike Foxtrot, India, WV4MFI, Ted Dallas, low power. We got you, Ted, WB4MFI. You may be low power, but you're solid in the repeater. Okay. One last try. Any other RF check-ins before I move on to Echo Link? RF check-ins only in 5 BB. Scott in. Okay, now let's move over to Echo Link. Let's see who's over there. In 5 KRG. Kevin, do you want to check in? Level 5, Oscar Fox Trot, Clay in the seat. Okay, Clay. In 5 OS, I got gotcha. you. Again, in 5 KRG, did you want to check in, Kevin? IMS uh, JJ, are you are you quiet or do you want to check in on audio? He's quiet again tonight. I'll check in, JJ. In five IMS, JJ is muted this evening. Uh, Chaz is already here. Kelly K five K T X, do you want to check in on audio? Kilo 5, Kilo Tango X-Ray Kelly in for a couple more weeks. Okay, Kelly, you cut out. Uh, what was your location again tonight? K5 KTX, my location is Quinlan. I'm here for two more weeks. Very good, uh, Kelly. I don't know where you're going. I hope it's still within range of Skynet. Okay, let's see who else. W5EBB, David, do you want to check in here to Skynet?
I guess not. KG5BZW. Jay, do you want to check in the Skynet? Gotcha, Jay, KG5, BZW. Okay. Would anybody like to check in via any mode to Skynet? This is N5 BB, net controller. Okay, now let's move to general announcements. Does anybody have any general announcement for tonight's NIP? This could be amateur radio related, astronomical, space, or something of general interest to licensed hands. If so, please come now with your call sign only. This is in 5 bb Skynet, looking for announcements. Give, you, give us your call sign. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. NT5 TM, go right ahead, Tony. This is N5BB, Skynet. Thank you, Bill. I'll keep this very short because I bet almost everyone heard this on TechNet. Uh, this Tuesday is the next meeting of the Dallas Amateur Radio Club. More details at W5FC.org. I believe we'll be having not only a regular meeting program, but a special guest, Ham Threads, the folks who sell us so much awesome embroidered ham stuff, everything from uh, raincoats to ball caps. There's all case you want it, and it's got your call sign and the club logo on it. Uh, they make it for you. Uh, going backwards, this Monday is a Ham Fixins Monday. Please eat before the net. We meet right here at 7. Uh, cooking tips, recipes, and kitchen anecdotes are all welcome. This Sunday, we have a Racy's training net at 8 and a meeting on the air at 7. Uh, tonight, we do have one more net left, uh, Galaxina, which I have now tried watching, uh, and technically everyone still has time to try watching it, but really Skynet's going to be a lot more exciting for you. Uh, we'll be trashing that movie tonight at just after 10.30. And one other quick announcement, the White Rock Lake Amateur Radio Club has three, not one, not two, but three radio foxes on the loose in the immediate area of White Rock Lake. They're not all in the same park. Uh, but they are all fun to find. They're going to be out there tomorrow from 9 to 5. Uh, please have a look at White Rock. Let's see, what, what do we use for our current URL? WA5WRL.org or WhiteRockHams.wordpress.com or just go to your favorite search engine and search for White Rock Lake Amateur Radio Club. Anyway, I hope we all have a great Skynet and survive the afterglow. NT5TM. Okay, hope nobody's sitting on their microphone. It's by BB, net control. There we go. This is N5 BB, Skynet. Does anybody have any questions or comments about Tony's items or any other news items? This is N5 BB. Okay. There are two satellite related, amateur satellite related uh, nets here in the Dallas area. On Tuesday nights, most Tuesday nights, we have a net at 8 p.m. on this repeater, uh, 146.88 megahertz. Uh, usually, Tom N5HYP is net control. All are welcome to check in. You do not need to be an AMSAT member. 
However, first Tuesday of the month is the Dallas M. Radio Club Club Night. There's no MSAT uh, Dallas Net that night. So this coming Tuesday will be the club meeting. There will be no MSAT Net. But all the remainder of Tuesdays of March, there will be one on, uh, on Tuesday night at 8, 8, 8 p.m. Now, on Wednesday night at 9 p.m., on the Arlington 147.140 megahertz repeater with a PL tone of 110.9 positive offset. There's an AMSAT West Net. So we get more of the people in the mid cities and Tarrant County and areas to the west of the DFW Metroplex. Although I can hit it easily from Irving. So that's every Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the Arlington 147.14. Here on this repeater, there's a bunch of nets on some nights of the week on this repeater, 146.88. On Monday evening, we have ham fixings net on the first and third Mondays. We have emergency communication 101 net on the second Monday of the month. On the fourth Monday of the month, we have geek net. And if there is a fifth Monday of the month, there is not always. We have a surprise net. If we told you what it was, it wouldn't be a surprise. I told you about the Tuesday nets on this repeater. On Friday net night, there's a certain city simulation net. All kinds of emergency-related stuff starting at 8 p.m. on this repeater. Learn about emergency radio communications. Then on Saturday nights, we have the night of nets. We have TechNet at 7 to 8 p.m. usually. And then, of course, SkyNet from 9 p.m. to 10.30. And then we have the Afterglow Net starting at 10.30, continuing until whatever, usually nearly midnight. Then on the first and third Sunday evenings, we have the Dallas Amateur Radio Club meeting on the air at 7 p.m., followed at 8 p.m. by the Dallas Racy's Net. Every day we also have the ARL National Traffic System Training Net at 6.30 p.m. on this repeater. And then at 10.30 p.m. on the Irving 146.72 megahertz repeater, we have the late National Traffic System Net. And that's... Um, but please listen carefully when there's a net on that only transmit at the direction of net control. So, we have an Afterglow movie tonight. Tom, can you tell us about this fantastic, amazing, awesome movie? This is in 5BB, Skynet. Oh, thank you, Bill. Indeed I can. And uh, here it is, and then i got something to say beyond that. Here's tonight's Afterglow Info. The year is 3008. The Intergalactic Space Police are on the beat. They sat behind an asteroid waiting for the first opportunity to clock and ticket the suspicious bird-like spaceship exceeding the galactic speed limit. Sergeant Thor pulled the vehicle over and began the usual question set. Did you know you were driving on expired plates and in excess of one million miles per hour? No, sir, I didn't, replied the mysterious alien. Thor returned to his space vehicle as the menacing ship pulled away, leaving the officer high and dry. Immediately, they pursued the violator. Believe it or not, I know you know, and you think I make all this stuff up, but there's actually a scene in the movie I didn't even know existed that pretty much is what I just described. You have now been warned. Join us for another exploitation film this time it's from the future join us tonight at 10 30 p.m for galaxina from 1980 good luck this is ke5 bet i see it back to uh, good luck you're going to need it very good tom thank you very much okay do we have any additional check-ins questions or comments this is in 5 bb skynet No, 
I think we've scared everybody else away. Chaz, KF5GHA, this is N5BB. It's time for the te Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events. What's going on with TAS? Thank you, Bill. Good evening, everyone. The next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be held on Friday, March the 24th. The meeting will be held at 7.30 p.m. in person at the University of Texas at Dallas, and also there will be a Zoom session simultaneously. The feature speaker, I'm not sure of the feature speaker or, or their topic, so oh well. Saturday night public observing sessions have begun again. Saturday night, uh, Skynet was picked to be on Saturday night so that there was an opportunity for live reports from the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas public observing sessions. Now tonight, the first Saturday of the month, the stargazing is held at Fairview. Is there any ham radio operator that's at the Fairview observing session who would like to make a report? Come now with your call sign. That's a little bit distant to get a report in by RF from there. Okay. Well, check the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas website, texasastro.org, for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing sessions. And this is KF5JJ, Vector and Net Control. Bill, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Chaz. Next, I'm going to talk about National Space Society events and activities. I happen to be the uh, member at large and membership director of the National Space Society North Texas chapter. We meet each second, the Sunday, let me start over again, on the second Sunday afternoon of every month except for December. We have a meeting at Spring Creek Barbecue in Irving in the corner of Beltline and 183. The meeting starts at 3.30 p.m. We also have a, uh, a online version. You can, it's a hybrid meeting, so you can look at it via WebEx also. Um, the big news is International Space Development Conference 2023. Uh, which is sponsored by the National Space Society, will be held in Frisco, Texas. That's right, the DSW Metroplex, on May the 25th to the 28th, 2023. So this is coming up just in a couple of months. It's not very long. It's like 10 weeks away. You can find details at uh, ISDC2023 dot nss dot org national space society that's nss members get significant discounts when signing up for isdc you can join in national space society at space dot nss dot org slash join hyphen national hyphen space hyphen society or I'm sure you can find that with a web search. New National Space Society members will get a complimentary, no charge, one-year membership in the North Texas chapter. Contact Bill Byram, myself, at space at byram.net or in 5BB at ARRL.net for more details. Or if you have questions about our upcoming meetings here locally. The most recent North Texas Chapter National Space Society event was Engineers Week at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History last Saturday, February 25th. We had a lot of fun over there, so a lot of uh, adults and kids. The March meeting of our local chapter will be on Sunday afternoon to March the 12th. It's not tomorrow, it's a week after tomorrow. Starting at 3.30 p.m. at Spring Creek Barbecue, Highway 183 in Irving. Uh, this will be a hybrid meeting. If you want to attend virtually, you can contact me in 5BB at ARL.net. The speak 
speaker will be our own local chapter president, Ken Ruffin, with his topic, Mars Exploration, Past, Present, and Future. I talked to Ken earlier tonight, and he has updated this, so he's updating it for the latest information, because it changes every six months. There's all kinds of new things going on with what we're going to do on Mars, and the moon for that matter. You can find more information about the local chapter of National Space Society by going to ntx.nss.org. That's ntx, the abbreviation for North Texas, ntx.nss.org. There's also an active Facebook page. Just look for National Space Society of North Texas. Uh, we also have a activity on the last Friday of every month, uh, and uh, this activity is a social activity in Irving that I uh, arrange, and it's called uh, Space Rendezvous. And so we've been holding it so far at the uh, 54th Street. Uh, a restaurant and uh, um, bar, I guess it is, uh, which is on Highway 183 near Olympus. This is uh, between Beltline and um, MacArthur on the north side of Highway, excuse me, not 183, Highway 635. So it's the north side of LBJ Expressway, Highway 635. Uh, it's east of Beltline, west of MacArthur near Olympus. Space nerds come and would we'll talk about spacey things and see what's going on with us. It's a, it's a social event. Again, that's held on the last Friday of every month, starting at 6 p.m. in Irving. Again, if you have any questions, contact me in 5BB at ARRL.net. Okay, that's everything I have about National Space Society. Uh, does anybody have any questions or the additional check-ins? This is in 5 bb Skynet. Okay, I found Jerry. Hello, Melissa. KF5GRH. Uh, are you just checking in, or do you have more any comments or questions? Oh, I am just checking in for the first time. Good evening, Bill. Cap okay, five, Jerry. Elton Carrollton. Oh, you're outside your normal range. Well, very good. Have fun in Carrollton. And, uh... You know, come back again. So, next we have the discussion topic of the evening, which means you have to listen to me again. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some uh, recent, I say recent, this is published in, in, in the Scientific American in, in December on their blog online, but it was published in the actual magazine, the March issue. Uh, neutrinos from a nearby galaxy reveal black hole secrets. The Ice Cube Observatory has detected neutrinos from an active galaxy for the first time, revealing clues about how supermassive black holes gobble matter. So, this is the first time this has happened that we've actually been using neutrinos to, to do significant uh, uh, research into uh, astronomy. There's only one supernova that's ever was the only other astronomical object that was verified 100% essentially to uh, have emitted neutrinos other than the sun. In the, this is in Scientific American. In the zoo of subatomic particles, neutrinos are strange beasts. 
unlike more familiar particles such as electrons and protons, ghostly neutrinos barely interact with other matter at all. They can fl fly right through a planet as if it weren't even there. This makes it irritatingly difficult to detect them. And for neutrinos streaming in from cosmic objects in the sky, even harder to know exactly where they came from. In a recent study published in Science, the, the journal, researchers identified an extragalactic source for these subatomic particles. For the first time, astronomers have confidently detected neutrinos from NGC 1068, a galaxy with a huge and actively feeding black hole in its center. The neutrinos are being created outside the black hole's point of no return, the event horizon, although it's not clear just how. Several mechanisms are plausible. Scientists are hoping this discovery will change how they understand not just NGC 1068, but all such galaxies. As a bonus, they think the finding may have revealed the source of a faint glow of neutrinos we see everywhere we look in the sky. This is N5BB, Skynet. Material that falls toward a black hole first forms a flattened accretion disk orbiting around it. Friction heats this disk of matter to incredible temperatures, causing it to glow so brightly it outshines the entire host galaxy. Let me repeat that. <laughs> Friction heats this disk around the central black hole to incredible temperatures causing it to glow so brightly it outshines the entire host galaxy. We call such galaxies active, and they are among the most luminous objects in the universe. In the case of NGC 1068, detecting that brilliant light is difficult because thick clouds of opaque cosmic dust absorb essentially all of it, letting virtually no signal out. This is where neutrinos' most annoying property is an advantage to us. They can pass right through those dust clouds and fly out to space, eventually reaching Earth. Still, we're left with the problem of detecting them. How do you measure neutrinos when they pass unscathed through your detector? The good news is that to neutrinos, matter is only mostly permeable. Although it's extraordinarily rare, some do manage to interact with matter, but it takes a very special kind of observatory to see it. Located almost exactly at Earth's south pole, the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory is just such a place, and it's not your standard astronomical facility. For one thing, it doesn't use a mirror to collect and focus light from cosmic objects as telescopes do. Instead, it has a series of relatively simple optical sensors hung along dozens of vertical strings, creating a 3D array of more than 5,000 sensors that can detect the locations and times of flashes of light. For another, it's buried under more than a kilometer of Antarctic ice. When a neutrino travels through the ice, it has some small chance of slamming into the nucleus of one of the oxygen or hydrogen atoms in that ice. But actual impacts are exceedingly uncommon. Trillions of neutrinos pass through every cubic centimeter of matter on Earth every second. The measurable physical interactions with that matter may only happen days apart. When they do occur, these interactions create high-speed semitopic subatomic scrapnel, particles moving away from the nuclear collision site at just under the speed of light. These then plow through the ice as well. Here's the fun part. They actually travel faster than light can move through the ice. No laws of physics are broken, though. The speed of light in a vacuum is the ultimate cosmic speed limit. That's 300 million you know, meters per second. 
but light moves more slowly when it travels through matter. Particles cannot move faster than light in a vacuum, but they can travel faster than light through matter. When they do, they create a kind of photonic boom, like the sonic shock wave created when something travels through air faster than the speed of sound. These faster-than-light events manifest as bright flashes of blue light called Cherenkov radiation. They can be seen for some distance through the clear Antarctic ice and can be picked up by ice cubes detectors. This is in 5 bb Dallas Amateur Radio Club Skynet in progress. This phenomena allows scientists to detect neutrino events from space, but there's a problem with unwanted events that mimic the desired signals. Subatomic particles from other sources in the universe, called cosmic rays, can hit our atmosphere and create similar flashes of light, confusing the measurements. Scientists can differentiate between the two kinds of signals in a clever way, though by using the Earth itself as an immense filter. Neutrinos coming from space will come from every direction, including up through the Earth. Cosmic rays, however, will come only from the sky above the Antarctic Observatory because they can't beam straight through the Earth as neutrinos do. The detectors in the ice cube can measure direction and filter out the events coming from above, thus ensuring scientists keep only the hits from cosmic neutrinos. So again, they're only detecting neutrinos that go through the Earth and up into their detector in the ice in Antarctica. Uh, Ice Cube has detected millions of neutrinos overall, but only a few hundred at most appear to have come from bona fide cosmological objects. Some things out there in the universe are the sources of these neutrinos. The question is, what are they? Looking over data taken from 2011 to 2020, the Ice Cube Collaboration, a huge collection of scientists, engineers, data analysts, and more, very careful to trace the trajectories of the incoming cosmic neutrinos. They found several spots on the sky that appear to be statistically significant sources of neutrinos. So what's the detection with the largest number of neutrinos? A total of 79, plus or minus 20 or so, neutrinos over that period are coming from the direction of NGC 1068. This lovely spiral galaxy is relatively close, a mere 47 million light years from us, and bright enough to be spotted with binoculars. Earlier work analyzing ice cube neutrinos pointed to NGC 1068 as a possible source but the data weren't strong enough at the time to claim a discovery. These results change that. The detection of neutrinos ostensibly coming from this active galaxy is a big deal. The neutrinos that the astronomers saw have phenomenally high energy, more than a tera electron volt each. That is trillions of times the energy of the visible light photons we see coming from the galaxy. The particle's huge energy must be created in an extremely powerful cosmic particle accelerator. And with an actively feeding big black hole, several options are possible. For example, the turbulent ionized miasma of matter above and below the disk of material around the black hole is infernally hot and contains powerful magnetic fields that can pump fast energies into particles accelerating them only almost to light speed. Another way involves the magnetic field in that accretion disk getting twisted up near the black hole, creating twin vortices such as tornadoes called jets that can fling particles away at high speeds. Shock waves generated in the jets as charged particles slam into one another can also produce the energies needed for high energy neutrinos. Such jets are known to exist in NGC 1068. This is Skynet in 5BB Net Control. 
detecting these neutrinos from the NGC 1068 will give astronomers insight into the forces involved there, as well as into which specific engines are responsible for them. Quite a boon for, given the hidden nature of black holes. Fewer than 100 NGC 1068 neutrinos were detected at Earth, but they would have been diluted as they traveled across the vast volume of space. Accounting for this reduction, the astronomers say the total number of neutrinos generated by the black hole must be so huge that they carry away a billion times as much energy as our sun emits. So these neutrinos, which of course don't interact with matter very often, but there's so many of them, they have so much energy in them, it's, it's about a billion times as much energy as our sun emits, which is very large, as you realize. These observations also provide a major clue for another mystery. Neutrinos come to Earth from all over the sky, creating a background glow across the heavens. The source of this glow has been difficult to pin down. Neutrinos from several other active galaxies were also seen in the ice cube data, although with less statistical certainty than for NGC 1068. And there are many millions of these galaxies throughout the universe. The new data indicate that if they emit neutrinos much as NGC 1068 does, these more distant galaxies could be the source of the cosmic neutrino background, similar to how individual stars in the sky blur together to form the continuous glow of the Milky Way you can see from a dark set at night. This is N5BB Skynet Net Control from the Dallas Amateur Radio Club. Not long ago, we knew of only two astronomical neutrino sources. The Sun, where neutrinos are created in the nuclear fires at its core, and supernova 1987A, a relatively nearby exploding star that admit, emitted a transient flash of neutrinos once and then was gone. Every big galaxy in the, in the universe has a supermassive black hole at its core, and any of them can potentially be active. Yet, though ubiquitous, they can be difficult to observe. With a positive detection of neutrinos coming from at least one, and probably several of them, astronomers have opened up a new window on these prodigious monsters. That was written by Phil Plate, who writes the Bad Astronomy Newsletter, which I recommend following. And that's all I have. Are there any questions or comments or check-ins? This is N5BB, Skynet. Okay, I don't immediately see anything on Echo Link. So let's move ahead. Chaz, it's time for What's Up? KF5GHA and 5BB. Thank you, Bill. This is Chaz, KF5GHA. We call this segment of Skynet What's Up because it's all about what's going on astronomically over the next couple of weeks. Slide Master, that was slide number one of mine. Slide number two, please. Now, I haven't talked about potentially hazardous asteroids, PHAs, in a while. We are monitoring over 2,300 asteroids that could, at some time in the future, may run into the Earth. On February, uh, I think that was, I don't know, I think it was February 23rd, we have had an asteroid come closer to the Earth than it was to the Moon. It was, uh, 2023 DR was the name of the asteroid. On an average, about every two weeks or so, we watch an asteroid come closer to us on the moon. Even though most of these are only 1 to 20 meters in diameter, it makes for a very bad day for some people if it hit the Earth. I will make a prediction that sometime over the next month, we will have a slow news day which is unlikely, but uh, we might hear about asteroid 436774 in the media. This asteroid is about three-fourths of a kilometer in diameter. This size of object hitting the Earth would cause some major damage. But
but it won't get within about 3 million miles of the Earth. So the media think uh, they need something more to worry about other than a world war, winter storms, electric outages, computer chip shortages, food shortages, gasoline and diesel shortages, and the like. By the way, Charlie knows what time Skynet is. For up-to-date information about asteroid encounters, you can check out the website spaceweather.com. Slide master, slide number three, please. On February the 27th was when the first quarter moon occurred, so the current phase of the moon is a waxing gibbous. On March the 7th is the full moon, just in a few days. On March the uh, the 20, on March the 14th, the third quarter moon will be occurring. On March the 19th, the moon is at perigee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is closest to the Earth, at a distance of 352,696 kilometers. New moon will be on March the 21st. First quarter moon is on March the 28th. And on March 31st, the moon is at apogee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is furthest from the Earth at a distance of 404,919 kilometers. Slide master, slide number four, please. March 1st was when we would have gotten a good, this past Wednesday, would have gotten a good look at the very rare and close conjunction of the two brightest planets, Jupiter and Venus. In a telescope, you would have been able to see both of them in the same field of view. It was, they were only half a degree apart from each other. This was a spectacular sight to the unaided eyes, as well as with binoculars and telescopes. Unfortunately for us here in North Texas, it was not clear that night. Slide master, slide number five, please. On March the 11th, there is a unique conjunction of Jupiter and the asteroid Vesta in the western evening sky. Don't talk too much about asteroids because most of them, well, are kind of faint. But you can see Vesta with a pair of binoculars. Slide master, slide number six. Early Sunday morning on March the 12th at 2 a.m., we turn our clocks forward by one hour to 3 a.m. So it's the beginning of daylight saving time. There has been some tries in both the Texas Lature and the daylight time all year long, but so far no action has occurred. If no action happens, we'll return to standard time on November the 5th, 2023. Slide master, slide number seven, please. On March 19th, there's a conjunction of Saturn and the moon in the early morning eastern, well, east, southeastern sky. Slide master, slide number eight. March the 20th is the moment of vernal equinox and the beginning of spring at 4.24 p.m. Central Daylight Time for the Northern Hemisphere. On that day, the sun will rise directly east and set directly west everywhere on the surface of the Earth. A unique day. Slide master, slide number nine. On March the 22nd, there is a conjunction of three objects, Jupiter, Vesta, and the moon, in the western evening sky. Mm, there's that asteroid again. Slide master, slide number 10. So, have you tried to look for Canopus? Last week, I well, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I challenged you to try to find Canopus very low in the southern sky. Uh, right around now. Look about 35 degrees below Sirius to find it. And this is KF5JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 11. Just to review, the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club Meeting is going to be on Friday, March the 24th. It's held at 7.30 p.m. at the University of Texas at Dallas and also held on Zoom. And Saturday night was picked to, uh, Skynet was picked to be on Saturday night so that there'd be an opportunity for live reports from the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas public observing sessions. But there doesn't seem to be anyone at that session that's a ham that can get to this repeater tonight. 
For more details, go to texasastro.org for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing sessions. Slide master, slide number 12. Now, do any of you out there in Radio Land have any questions or need to fill on any information, or do you just have a general astronomy question? Come now with your call sign if you have a question or need to fill. hearing anything. Slide Master, slide number 13, so is the moon wanes in a couple of weeks. Those are these words for this segment of Skynet. Stay safe, keep well, pray for a world. It's the only one where humans live. And until next week, well, actually, I'll be doing another Skynet segment in a few minutes. Keep looking up so you know what's up. And this is KF5JJ Chaz. Back to our net control. Bill, it's all yours in 5BB. Well, thank you, Chaz. Now everybody knows what's up. Okay, are there any other check-ins or questions or comments? This is N5BB, Skynet. Kilo Bravo 9, Sir Oscar Kilo, Sean Fort Worth, just checking in. And they're recognized KB9, it's okay. Hello, Sean. Any other check-ins? Kilo India 5, Kilo Whiskey Golf Cruise in Arlington. And a recognized cruise, KF5, KWG. Do we have any other check-ins? Brenda WB5OZL is unfortunately unable to be here for medical reasons, uh, but she's getting better, we hope. We believe. Tom, KE5ICX, give us some space exploration news. This is N5BB, Skynet. Thank you, Bill. And yeah, I'm chatting with her on the back channel here during the net. She's uh, doing much better, and uh, hopefully, we'll uh, they're going to move her over to rehab in, uh, in the next few days and uh, go ahead and do some physical uh, therapy. So, we're looking to see her coming back very soon. The first story I got for is the Astra rocket lost two NASA satellites due to a runaway cooling system error. Now I've got a picture of the thing, and I saw this, I watched this live on the web, and this is, I believe, the rocket that actually started to take off and then drifted directly to the right out of the picture before it even cleared the pad. Uh, it was very odd. But at any rate, this is what it says. It says, the runaway event caused by a catastrophic loss of Astra's final Rocket 3 launch last June, the company announced Wednesday on March 1st. Astra's launch vehicle 0010 lost two NASA hurricane tracking CubeSats on June 12, 2022 after the second stage failure of its booster and called Rocket 3.3. The overall Rocket 3 line facing a reported five failures and seven launches was canceled in August. Astra is working to make improvements for the more powerful Rocket 4 version. This is easily the most complex, in, in, complex investigation that Astra has ever conducted, read a joint statement concerning the mishap uh, from Astra's co-founder, Adam London, along with the head of Mission Assurance, Andrew Griggs. And oh boy, another rocket failure. Europe's Vega C rocket launch failure caused by nozzle fall law, uh, investigators say. A fault in the nozzle caused the failure of the European Vega C rocket's second ever flight, a commission concluded. Gradual deterioration of the rocket nozzle, boy, I can't talk, the rocket and nozzle are more specifically unexpected over erosion of the carbon, carbon insert inside the nozzle led to the loss of the Vega C on 
December 20th, an independent investigation commission says today, on March 3rd, of the European Space Agency press release. The criteria used to accept the CC throat, carbon to carbon throat insert, were not sufficient to demonstrate its flight worthiness. The commission was therefore concluded that this CC material can no longer be used for flight. And then uh, SpaceX Crew 6 astronaut mission. Uh, SpaceX has launched astronauts to the International Space Station and returned them to Earth for NASA since 2020. The company's current astronaut missions for NASA are Crew 6, which launched on March 2nd, and Crew 5, which launched on, uh, on uh, October 5th, 2022. But, uh, let's see, the Crew 6 mission is headed to the International Space Station while well, it's already there and is made up of the first United Arab Emirates astronaut to perform a long-duration mission as Sultan El Niyadi, NASA's uh, astronauts Warren Woody Holberg and Stephen Bowen, and Andre Zvediev of the Russian space agency Roscosmos. Cosmos. SpaceX June Crew 6 astronaut mission arrived at the International Space Station early Friday morning on March 3rd, and new pictures were released to show the occasion. The Crew Dragon mod uh, capsule, named Endeavour, docked with the ISS Harmony module at 1.40 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday, while the two spacecraft were flying off the coast of Somalia at an altitude of 261 miles. But that was an hour later than expected. SpaceX troubleshot a faulty sensor with one of the 12 hooks that helped the ca capsule connect to the ISS. Ground team sent the software override that fixed the issue. Then we have this week in space history on February 28, 1990. We have the sixth classified Department of Defense shuttle mission. It was the fourth mission to the station, the third successful docking, and the second visit with the resident crew uh, launched on Soyuz 26. On March 2nd, 1978, there was a launch of Soyuz 28. Czechoslovakian Vladimir Rimek uh, became the first non-American, non-Soviet in space. He and Alexei Gubarov joined the other cosmonauts aboard Salyut 6 and spent seven days doing experiments. Rimek and uh, uh, Czechoslovakian became the first person launched Space was not a bit well, I read that. The other crew was Alexei uh, Gubarov. The flight was the first mission in the Intercosmos program that gave Eastern Bloc and other communist states access to space through crewed and uncrewed launches. On March 3, 1969, was the launch of Apollo 9. James McDivitt and Rusty Schweiger became made the first manned test of the lunar module while Scott remained aboard the command module. Apollo 9, which flew from March 3rd to 13th of 69, was the third human space flight in NASA's Apollo program. Flown in low Earth orbit, it was the second crewed Apollo mission that the United States launched via a Saturn V rocket and was the first flight of a full Apollo spacecraft, the command module, and service module with a lunar module. The mission was flown to qualify the LM for lunar orbit operations in preparation for the first moon landing by demonstrating its descent and asset uh, propulsion system, showing that its crew could fly it independently, then rendezvous and dock with the CSM again, as would be required for the first crew landing. And we have space-related birthdays, all astronauts. On February 26, 1928, we had Anatoly Vilichenko uh, from Russia. He's launched uh, and flown on Soyuz 7 and 16. And also on February 26, 1958, Susan J. Helms uh, with NASA. She flew on STS 54, 64, 78, 101. Expedition 2, which encompassed uh, STS-102 and 105. And there is, of course, uh, we have one of those um, um, 
skip birthdays. February 29th, 1936, would be Jack Losma. He was an Apollo astronaut. He flew on Skylab 3 and also on STS-3. March 1st, 1924, uh, the birth of Deke Slate. He was one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts and was uh, grounded. was not allowed to fly until eventually the last Apollo mission, which is the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project, in 1976. On March 2nd, 1960, was the birth of Mikhail Tyrion, uh, Russian. He was on STS-105 and 108. That was Expedition 3. So he was TMA-9, Expedition 14. So he was TMA-11M, Expedition 38-39. On March 3rd, 1946, James Adam Adamson, he was uh, he was uh, astronaut on also on March 3rd, 1949, was uh, Bonnie J. Dunbar. She was on STS-61A, 32, 50, 71, and 89. Got a couple more. Then in 1949, uh, James Boss was born. He was on board STS-44, 53, 69, 101, and then Expedition 2, which had also visiting STS-102 and 105. And then finally, we have on March 4th, 1965, Yuri Lochenkov. He was born in, uh, Kaz uh, from Kaz Kazakhstan. He was on STS-100, Soyuz TMA-1, TM-34, and Soyuz TMA-13, which was the Expedition 18 mission. And that's it. That's all I got, Bill. Back to you, KE-5 ICX. Well, very good, Tom. This is N5BB Skynet. Do we have any questions, comments, or check-ins? This is N5BB. Hello, India 5, Uniform, Uniform, Julia, Dustin, Dallas, checking in. Okay, reading between the lines, I got KFIUUJ, hello Justin, and a very scratchy, but we understood your voice, John, K5JDW in the hinterland somewhere. And on Echolink, I see KI5ZOT, Kim. Kim, do you want to check into Skynet on voice? I guess not. And we also have Catherine, K-B-8-D-A-A. -A. Catherine, do you want to check into Skynet? Catherine, your voice didn't go through, but I saw you trying to check in, so I will check you in. Skynet is run by the Dallas Amateur Radio Club in North Texas here, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and everybody's invited to come back and visit us uh, every, even, every Saturday evening starting at 9 p.m. Central Time, and then that normally goes about 90 minutes until about 10.30 Central Time. So, uh, Kim and Catherine, you're very welcome to come in and listen to us or participate if you have any questions. Okay, one more one more call. Do we have any other check-ins to Skynet? This is N5BB. November 8, Whiskey, Whiskey, Romeo, and 8, WWR, Romeo and Grapevine. Late check-in for the count. Thanks for on that. It ain't WBR. Got you, Romy. Any other check-ins? Oh, 
Okay. I hear some dogs. I hear some barking dogs. Oh no, who let the dogs out? It's our own big dog, Chaz. Chaz, tell us about tell us about the dogs in the in the sky. KF five J H A N five B B. Chaz is going to give us a doggone good uh, talk here. Thank you, Bill. I haven't been called a dog for quite some time. Slide master, slide number 14. Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week This uh, is named in honor of Silent Key. Carolyn, KC5OZT, Carolyn contributed to Skynet each week, almost from its beginning in 2012 until May of 2019, with a detailed look at one particular constellation each week. Since there are about 52 easily visible constellations seen in Texas throughout the year out of the 88 total constellations of the sky, so Ms. Carolyn covered the entire sky as seen over North Texas in a year. And in her honor, we have continued that tradition of a constellation per week and named this segment after her. Ms. Carolyn's Constellation of this Week, yes, is a doggone good constellation, Canis Major, the big dog. Canis Major's name means the greater dog in Latin. Canis Major represents the bigger dog following Orion, the hunter in Greek mythology. The dog is often depicted pursuing a hare depicted by the constellation Lepus, or Lepus. Slide master, slide number 15. What everyone's been waiting for tonight, the jokes of the week. All right, here we go. Hold on to your seats. What does my dog and a cell phone have in common? Caller ID. You have to think about that one for a moment. What do you get when you cross a dog in a calculator? A friend you can count on. What do you call a cold canine? That would be a chili dog. What happened to the dog that swallowed a firefly? He barked with delight. What happened to the dog that ate nothing but garlic? His bark was worse than his bite. And finally, this last one in the series. Yes, I can hear the applause out there. A three-legged dog walks into the bar and says, I'm looking for the guy who shot my paw, P-A-W. Slide master, slide master, get me out of this. Slide number 16, please. is also known as Alpha Canis Majoris. Uh, the name Sirius means the sparkling one or more frequently the scorching one. Compared to the, compare the name Sirius with the English word to sear or meaning to burn or scorch. They both originate from the ancient Greek word Sirius, which means scorching. Uh, Sirius is also known as the dog star because it's the prominent in Canis Major, Orion's great hunting dog. In ancient times, it, as it does today, Sirius rose with the sun near the start of summer in the northern hemisphere. And ancient people believed that the hot days of summer was caused by Sirius's heat in addition to that of the sun. It is Sirius's position as the dog star that gave it rise to the phrase, the dog days of summer. At magnitude minus 1.4, Sirius is the brightest star in the sky as viewed from the Earth. At 8.4, Seven light years away, it is among the closest stars to the sun. It contributes greatly to its preeminence as the brightest star in the sky because Sirius is intrinsically brighter and is larger than the sun and is still a main sequence star and not a giant or supergiant star compared to Sirius uh, to Canopus, the second brightest star in the sky. Canopus shines at a magnitude minus 0 0.72 as seen from the Earth yet it's about 300 light years away. Sirius is a white star with a white dwarf companion, Sirius B, often called the pup. Sirius B is notoriously difficult to observe because it's a magnitude 8.3 and is often lost from the overwhelming glare from Sirius itself. 
series A and B are currently nine arc seconds apart, heading toward a maximum of 11.5 arc seconds away in just a couple of years in the year 2025, which would be easier to split then. This is KF5, JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 17. Altar, the name Altar is derived from the Arabic word meaning virgins, which may originate from an ancient Arabic legend uh, where Canis Major and Canis Minor were not dogs, but instead were two human sisters. Adar uh, uh, is a double star uh, with a 7.5 magnitude companion. In a telescope, it appears as a bright white primary with a much fainter white companion. The companion does not jump out at, at first. Aldra, yes, I guess that's how you pronounce it, also meet two sisters legend about Canis Major and Canis Minor. Aldra is a variable star varying from 2.38 to 2.48 magnitude, so not a big variation. It is an alpha Cygni type variable star, giving it an appearance of an apparent irregular period. It appears white in telescopes. There are many nearby stars in the field of view surrounding it all of varying brightness. Slide master, slide number 17. Oh, I already told you to do that. We're on slide 17 now, aren't we? M41 is the open cluster. can be seen with the naked eye from dark sky sights in the telescope. M41 may be in the field of view in your lowest power eyepiece uh, easily. You can see varying colors in the stars. Some look orange, while others look white or blue-white. There are many stars of varying brightness. Some of the peer arrange themselves in short lines or streaks. There's one particular bright star in the extreme edge of the cluster. Slide master, slide number 18. This is NGC 2360. It's an open cluster. It's easily noticeable as a fuzzy patch in a finder scope, but it's a pretty cluster. It fits nicely in the field of view in medium power eyepiece. Unlike M41, which has many different star brightnesses, most stars in NGC 2360 look about the same brightness. The star colors are also all about the same, white or blue-white. The cluster looks pretty in a low power field of view, while the stars surrounding it make a pleasing sight. And this is KF5 JHA, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 19. Here are a few more Astronomical League Observing Program objects in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. I'm just giving you a sampling of some of those objects. Now, the Astronomical League has, at last count, 75 different observing programs, most of which have about 100 objects. So if you observe just 10 different objects in an observing program each month, then you can earn an observing certificate and a pen in about a year from the Astronomical League. Slide master, slide number 20, and that is Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week, Canis Major, the Big Dog. I want to thank my friends Dave Hutchinson and Dennis Harwell for the research and words on deep sky objects that I use, borrow and steal for every Skynet. I also at times use the website constellation-guide.com for information. Now next time, I'll take a look at another doggone good constellation, Canis Minor, the little dog, and also Monoceros. What the heck is Monoceros? I think it should be a rhinoceros, but that's not what it is. We'll take a look at that next time on Skynet. And this is KF5, JJ, sending it back to our net control. Bill, N5, BB, it's all yours. 73, everyone. Thanks, JS. Do we have any additional check-ins, questions, or comments? This is N5, BB, Skynet. for the week. Tom, why don't you give us space launchers for the week, and then you can go on and continue into the next section tonight, which is re the uh, visible satellite passes. So space launches and visible satellite passes, any way you want to split up those two topics, Tom. Okay, 
K5ICX and 5BB. All right, very good, Bill. Uh, I'm probably going to concentrate on the launches, but uh, we'll see where we go here with the last eight minutes of the net. Uh, March 5th, 6th, we've got a launch of Owls 3. This is uh, from uh, Launchpad 2 at Tanakashima Space Center in Japan. The Japanese H3 rocket will launch its first test flight with Advanced Launch Land Observing Satellite 3, or Owls 3 for the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, it's also named Daichi-3, will capture high-resolution, wide-swath images of all the world's land sources, providing data for applications in disaster management, land use, urban sprawl, scientific research, and coastal and vegetarian environmental monitoring. The H-3 rocket for test flight one, or TF-1, will fly in the H-322S configuration with two first stage engines, two strap-on solid rocket boosters, and a short payload fairing. On March 8th, we have the launch of Terran 1. It's called Good Luck, Have Fun. This is a launch from Launch Cam Complex 16 at Cape Canaveral in Florida. The relatively space Terran 1 rocket will launch on its inaugural demonstration flight. It is the first orbital attempt by relativity and will not include a customer payload. May March 9th, Falcon 9 will launch OneWeb 17. This will be 40 satellites into Earth orbit by, oh, by the way, that's Cape Canaveral, uh, into orbit for OneWeb, which is developing and deploying Constellation hundreds of satellites in low Earth orbit for low latency broadband communications. This will be the third launch of OneWeb satellites with SpaceX and the 17th launch overall. Falcon 9's first stage booster will land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. March 11th, 12th, another Falcon 9, SpaceX DRS-27, launching from Cape Kennedy on Launch Complex 39A. Uh, this will launch a Dragon 2 spacecraft on a cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. Falcon 9's first stage booster will land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. March, uh, sometime in March to be determined, a Falcon 9, how about that, Starlink 2-8, will launch from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, another batch of Starlink Internet satellites. This mission will deploy the Starlink satellites into a high inclination orbit inclined 70 degrees at the equator. The Falcon 9 first stage booster will land on a drone ship in the Pacific Ocean. We have to be determined in March, Olympic K2 will launch from Valkomir Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The Russian government Proton rocket with a Breeze M upper stage will launch the Olympic K communication satellite for the Russian military. In mid March comes GSLV Mark III, one Web 18. This will launch from Sadish Dewan Space Center in Sarihari Kota, uh, India. India's geosynchronous satellite launch uh, will launch 36 satellites into orbit for one Web, which is developing a constellation, but you've already heard that. Next up, March 17th, 18th, Falcon 9 will launch an SCS 18 and 19 from SLC 40 at Cape Canaveral. The Falcon 9 rocket will launch those two communication satellites for SES of Luxembourg. They're built by Northrop Grumman and will provide C-band television and data services over the United States. The Falcon 9's first stage booster will land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. Then exciting and will be a very interesting orbital test flight of the Starship. Uh, the launch is to be determined. It will be sometime in March, we do believe. This is at Starbase Boca Chica Beach, Texas. The Super Heavy and Starship launch vehicle will launch on its first orbital test flight. The mission will attempt to travel around the world for nearly one full orbit, resulting in a re-entry and splashdown of the Starship near Hawaii. March also, we'll see uh, Falcon 9 Starlink 6-2. That'll launch from SLC-40. Boy, this is all sounding alike, isn't it? At Cape Canaveral, another batch of second-generation Starlink V2 mini-internet satellite. Everybody say it together. The Falcon 9's first stage booster will land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. All right, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to skip on down to um, visible satellite passages for the week. We've got the International Space Station. 
uh, that has a couple of reasonably good passes, one on March 8th. Uh, this one will be a minus 2.1 magnitude at 5.46 in the morning out of the north-northwest, reach its highest point at 31 degrees at 5.49, and fall to the east-southeast at 5.52. Next we have on March 8th, I'm sorry, on March 10th, March 10th, we'll have another uh, Pass. There's actually two, but this is the second one. It's quite good. Minus 3.9 magnitude, 5:47 a.m. It'll reach its highest point at 5:50 at 73 degrees out of the southwest, and it'll follow the southeast at 5:53. And then finally, on March 11th, uh, we have at uh, 5:01 in the morning, it'll be a minus 3.2 magnitude, reach its highest point at 54 degrees at 5:01:54. This means that it will be actually coming out of shadow at its highest point at 54 degrees and then fall at 505 to the east, southeast. Um, Bill, I'm going to end it there since there's only two minutes left in the net. Back to you, KE5 ICF. I like it. So does anybody else want to make any comments, ask any questions, or check in? This is N5BB, Skynet. Nobody additionally coming up on Echo Link, so we will close the net. Once I scroll down here, tonight we had 25 I'm PM operational and all my sitting on the air. Thanks to all who checked in this evening. We hope you join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Central Time to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We are all... Um, if you'd like to try your hand, contact any of the net controls and send an email to nets at w5sc.org. And... Um, you can follow topics and discussion about this net and astronomy in general on Facebook and Twitter. Sigh. As well as our audio and video streams, video archives, and other useful internet resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. Until next Saturday night, this is N5BB, Bill. I'll be closing the net at 10.30 p.m. local time. Returning to repeat our normal amateur use. As I leave, remember, not tomorrow, but the week later, uh, March the 12th Sunday, is what daylight saving time uh, changes over. So you change your clocks, not tomorrow night, but a week later. Be ready for it. 73, everybody, enjoy the evening discovering the universe. This is N5BB. Good night, and over to Tom for the Afterglow net. Great net, Bill. Thank you for being net control this evening. And this is KE5 ICX helping net control for the Afterglow movie net. But before we start that, we're going to take about a five minute break, do all the things you normally have to do after a 90 minute net. When we come back, we'll be discussing the movie Galaxina from 1980. It's a winner. Come back in five. This is KE5 ICX. Tom, I think you must have seen the PBS series Mr. Winner. If you've seen that, yeah, it's a winner. Inside DB. Good night.
right, it's time for everybody to go back to their seat, sit down next to the radio, enjoy the glow for the next 90 minutes as we discuss tonight's wonderful movie, which I'm about to describe. And welcome to the Afterglow Movie Net, the only thing worth listening to and talking about from 10.30 until midnight on a Saturday evening. Because let's face it, you haven't been out out on a Saturday evening from 10.30 until 12 o'clock in like decades. So it's okay. Here we go. The script I'm about to give you comes from Wikipedia, so I give credit to the fine wiki that provides us all the information on our movies. Uh, this is what it says about the movie itself. This Galaxina is a low-budget 1980 American science fantasy comedy film that's debatable, written and directed by William Dash. The film stars 1980 Playboy Playmate of the Year, Dorothy uh, Stratton. I wonder if she's related to our uh, MTX person. Okay. Who was murdered? Oh, golf. 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 Uh, I don't know. Whatever it is. That, uh, here, who was murdered? by her husband shortly after the film's release. Besides his homages to and parodies of science fiction mainstays Star Trek, Star Wars, and Alien, this film also pokes fun at the Western genre. It won the Audience Award of the 1983 Brussels International Festival of Fantasy Film. Who knows why and who are those people? Brussels is just too happy. The film, viewed by the characters in Galaxy, Zena is a clip from the 1960 Eastern Bloc sci-fi film, First Spaceship on Venus. We have suffered. I mean, we've seen that film as well. The clip was used because First Spaceship on Venus was a crown international picture when first released in the United States in 1962. The Intergalactic Space Police Cruiser Infinity is on patrol duty in deep space. The ship is captained by the incompetent Cornelius Butt, played by the inevitable... In, 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 well, it's played by Avery Schreiber. You know that guy, the one with the bushy hair. And his crewman, his first officer, Sergeant Thor, played by Stephen Mock. Pilot, Space Cowboy, Private Robert Buzz McHenry, played by J.P. Hinton, Maurice, uh, played by Lionel Mark Smith, a black humanoid alien with pointy ears and bad wings, and Sam, played by Tad Reno, an Asian man who quotes Confucius. Also aboard the Galaxina, Dorothy Stratton, a voluptuous blonde android servant, and Rock Eater, a rock-eating alien prisoner confined to the brig. While the Infinity hides behind an asteroid, I told you, a suspicious-looking bird-like space flies by, and Buzz decides to pursue it. I told you that, too. They try to question the ship's pilot, a mysterious masked figure who rudely terminates the communication. I told you that, too. The two ships exchange laser fire, but the bird ship gets away. After an encounter, Galicina serves a dinner of chicken-flavored food pills to Captain Butt, Thor, and Buzz. The three men are stunned by her beauty, and Thor decides an electric shock, shock when he tries to slap her buttock. I didn't write this. Tired of pill food, Captain Butt decides to eat an alien egg confiscated from the rock eater prisoner. The egg sickens him, and on top of the dinner table, mimicking the scene from the movie Alien, he coughs up a baby alien creature that quickly scurries away. This is KE5 on ACX. Later, the crew receives orders to proceed to prison planet Altair-1 to recover a priceless stolen gemstone called the Blue Star. Brava! Every time the stone is mentioned, an invisible heavenly chorus is heard by the characters. The trip will take the Infinity 27 years to complete, requiring that the Earth enter cryogenic sleep. Before doing so, they make a quick stop at the asteroid, at an asteroid brothel. Galaxina remains in charge of the ship while the crew is in stasis. All alone, she reprograms herself to become more human. She learns to talk and disables her electrical defense mechanism. Ah, that must have been the 
time when I went to do something else because I couldn't figure out why nobody was being electrocuted. She visits Thor's sleep chamber periodically, embracing it, telling the sleeping floor that she loves it. Later, the baby alien visits Butt's chamber and tampers with the controls. When the crew awakens at their destination, Butt emerges from his pod, an old man with a shaggy gray hair, much like he is today. Thor is seduced by Galaxina, and he falls in love with her. Although she lacks the proper hardware to have sex, she assures Thor that these components can be ordered through the Android catalog. Uh, let's see. Let me read ahead, just in case. Yes, he can't wait until she gets back to get her modification. Ship reaches out there one and lands. Knowing that the local aliens are hostile to humans, Galaxina volunteers to go look for the blue star from uh, while the others stay on the ship. She works in, walks into town and enters a human restaurant and discovers that this means the restaurant serves humans as food to alien creatures. There she finds Ordic, Drick, Ordric, the masked creatures the crew encountered earlier. Ordric possesses the blue star, ta-da, and Galaxina attacks him. Are you still with me? Galaxina discovers Ordic is a robot when she smashes his head open. Ordic is deactivated, and Galaxina takes the star. And here we go, the last two short paragraphs. As she flees the town, she is captured, captured by a gang of bikers, descendants of the first settlers of Altair One. Their leader announces that he will sacrifice at Galaxina to their deity, Harley David's son. And with the power of the Blue Star, uh -huh, he will take control of the universe. Thor and Buzz, who have been looking for Galaxina, rescue her from the bikers and return to the ship. Ordic attacks and boards the Infinity as soon as they reach space. He takes back the Blue Star and confides every, confines everyone to the bridge. The baby alien, now fully grown, sneaks onto the bridge and attacks Ordric. The creature, believing Butt to be his, its mother, goes to the brig and gives Butt the keys to the cell door. The crew escapes the brig and rushes the bridge, finding that Ordic has been torn to pieces. While contemplating the reward they will receive for returning the blue star, uh -huh, they notice that the rock eater has eaten it. And there you have it, the story. Hook, line, and sinker. And with that, I will now begin the check-in. Oh, and don't forget, as you probably already know and have listened many times before, we will discuss this movie's plot, followed by characterization, followed by music, special effects, and anything you may have forgotten. So we will now begin the check-in, and if you are listening for the first time, you do not necessarily have to have seen Galaxina to actually participate in the net. Uh, you will be allowed to check in and give your reactions to other people's reactions, too. It's actually kind of fun. If you're not happy with it, or if you're somebody who likes this, who enjoys this net but can't stand this movie, pick another one. We don't care. So here we go. I'm going to take check-ins. Please come with your call sign, your name, and did you see Galaxina from 1980? Let's begin I did not. It's checking only. Copy on K5. November Tango 5, Tango Mike, Tony and Dallas. I think I saw about half of it. Sir Oscar Kilo, Sean Fort Worth. Yes, I've seen this movie. Kilo, India 5. 
five kilo whiskey golf cruise in Arlington. Yes, I saw some of this movie. Most of this movie. November Victor 5, Fox Trot, Virginia in Fort Worth. I saw some of the movie. Let's go ahead and people didn't complete their assignment. That's very bad. You will get an incomplete for tonight. But let me go ahead and acknowledge, folks, I got K5JDW, John. He's in Capel this week, and he did not see the film. It's okay, John. I'll ask you later on if you'd like to see the film. And t 5 pm Tony, he saw part of the film at accelerated rate. That's actually an excellent idea. Tony will tell you about it in detail. He watches the movies faster than normal speed so you can get through them faster and the, develop, the, the non-existent plots develop more quickly. I also got a KG5BZWJ near Rutherford. Yes, he saw part of the movie. KB5SOK Sean in Fort Worth. He completed his assignment and did see, I think, the whole movie. KI5KWG Cruz, who I expect is the gold standard of bad motion pictures. He did not see the complete film, but he did see part of it. He's over in Arlington. And NV5S Virginia in Fort Worth, she saw part of the movie as well. Maybe between all of us, we will have all seen part of the movie and saw different parts and therefore can describe them in detail. Anyone else want to check in? Uh, please come now. I'm looking at you, Echo Link, as well. If you'd like to join us, please come now with your call sign name. And did you see tonight's masterpiece movie, Galaxina from 1980? Okay, I hear none, so we'll go ahead. I think we got enough for a quorum, so I'll start at the top. Now, John checked in immediately, and he doesn't know anything about Galaxina, but I will come back to him and put him at the bottom of the list just to see what his reaction is. So we will begin with Tony, NT5TM. Tony, what did you think about the plot for Galaxina from 1980? This is KE5 ICX. Honestly, I think the plot was awesome. We had a uh, rampaging dinosaur, an attack of flatulence of epic proportions, uh, zombies... Oh, wait, wait, wait! I'm talking about Cert City Net, which actually had better writers. We actually had a lot of fun this Friday making up fake disasters. I mean, Aaron and I were smiling so hard. Uh, we had to practice being 911 call takers for one another. And, you know, just try to get the details. What's going on? Where are they? Location is so important. You can't send them any emergency services if you don't get their location. Uh, keep your cool, even if you fall out of your chair and your face hurts from smiling. Uh, <laughs> you know, get, get a good emergency report from them. We, we had great writers on Search City Simulation Net because we were all working together to make each other laugh. Unlike anyone connected with this movie, I just can't believe how they read a bunch of, this is a reference to that. Oh, look, this is meant to be a phallic symbol. Oh, look, this is meant to be like Alien. Oh, look, this is meant to sound like Star Wars, whatever. They just, they couldn't tell a chicken cross the road joke. There was just nothing original in this plot, and we were expected to laugh because they made boring, slow-paced, hackneyed allusions to other things. It was so slow. Uh, I didn't actually start watching After Blue movies with extra speed until last week with One Million Years B.C., which I could hardly take. Uh, I made it through an hour of this movie in 48 minutes, and it was still just interminable. Why? Why? But then Skynet started, so then I had to So I really think it took special talent to make a movie as humorless as this. 
I mean, surely someone could have made a fart joke by accident, but no. At least if they did, I never heard it. Uh, yeah, so slow, so painful, so unoriginal, so devoid of humor, so devoid of action, so devoid of interest, so devoid of, devoid of anything. Thus, I clicked stop and enjoyed Skynet. NT5TM. Thank you, Tony. So this is another winner. You really like this film. Next up is J KG five BZWJ. What did you think about the plot for Galaxina from 1980? This is Kilo Golf Five Bravo Zulu Whiskey. I can one second. Uh, echo link just be a little weird to us. Um, so yeah, they were clearly making certain references left and right, but um, yeah, it was. I had a long day today, and uh, I was, you know, had it was watch the movie or take a nap, and 20 minutes in. I actually did not have to watch the movie um, at high speed. I like I have to do some movies, but uh, uh, that was because I was already kind of out of it. And like, well, if the movie keeps me awake, uh, that's fine. If it, it's not, um, I basically stopped before I lost consciousness. And, um, you know, I had a little nap and things are good. It was just like, yeah, I don't know if I missed anything or not. Um, no, I, I kind of thought the, um, the little, per, um, um, whatever that, that, uh, transport thing and that, uh, there was something kind of amusing about the little thing that the, the, the captain trans, uh, was uh, transported upon, but other than that, I was like, yeah, I don't know. There, there just you know, wasn't really anything, anything I could think of that I really could jive with these characters. I just Uh, I just got tired of it, and really, I don't know. I probably would watch a little more if I had, if I had, didn't have to take a nap. But um, don't know what. I feel a little bit lost as because the original. Yeah, sure, I, I agree. But I, I feel like there's something else missing. The fact, besides a lack of humor, which is obvious. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a comedy that just wasn't funny. That's all I can say. KG5 VGW. Thank you, Jay. That's okay. You're at a loss for words. So were the writers for this movie, and I, I fully get it. Next up is Sean, KB5SOK. Sean, you saw, you actually watched the entire film, as did I, I think, except I may have fallen asleep through part of it, but I think I still count because I didn't walk away from the TV. So, Sean, what did you think of the plot for Galaxina from 1980? Yeah, this is KB9, it's okay. Uh, well, it sounds like I, I probably should have listened to Certain City. It sounds like it was entertaining. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but I wanted to complete my assignment, so I watched this movie last night. Oh, boy. You know, we, we've seen some, some pretty bad comedies on here, and uh, usually even the bad. This one, there was zero. This has got to be maybe one of the worst comedies I think we've seen on here. Oh, it was just 
one bad joke after another, and, and, and it was just boring, and there wasn't even good action in between. Um, see, as far as plot goes, there really was no real plot in this. I guess, yeah, they were after this blue crystal thingy, which, once again, if this thing was so important and so going to revolutionize everything, why did they not send the ships with hyperdrive to go get it? And after the people being in stasis for 27 years, what made them think that the guy they were going to meet would still be there and be waiting in a bar for 27 years? So there's just, <clears throat> excuse me, there's absolutely nothing that made sense in this. Uh, clearly, they were just trying to make jokes, but they're just not good jokes. Um, you know, we, we've seen way better uh, science fiction comedies, you know, done. Uh, you know, Spaceballs, uh, Ice Pirates, you know, and there's many others that have done a much better job of at least having a few chuckles along the way. And this thing was just horrible. <laughs> I wonder why I'd never heard of this movie, but uh, after seeing it, I know why. <laughs> I can't believe this thing got actual awards or when it premiered, that's uh, almost mind-blowing. <laughs> I'm not sure who these people were that were watching it. Uh, so yeah, this was basically just a movie with a lot of sex jokes that just didn't really, um, weren't even funny to adults, or I don't think they'd even been funny to kids. So uh, yeah, not a lot to say about this movie, unfortunately, just a, uh, yeah, just pretty rough. <laughs> but uh, back to that, KB9, that's okay. Thank you, Sean. Another thumbs up. Excellent. So this is getting really good. Next up is Cruz, KI5KWG. Cruz, your your happy comments about the nice movie, Galaxina from 1980. KI5KWG. Yeah. The, well, my favorite part was the, I, I wrote very few notes on this. And uh, the one, I don't know why it tickled me, but I really like the comment about a 2001, what was it, Belizean Thunder Ripple, as the wine being served. That was the only thing that struck me as, as somewhat humorous. And, and I really don't know why. I guess I just really needed something to laugh at. Um, yeah, the reason I didn't watch uh, all of this movie, I really kind of did. I played it all. But it, unlike most, unlike any, uh, if I wanted to go get a cup of coffee, I just left it running, went, got a cup of coffee, and came back a few minutes later. I didn't worry about what I'd miss because I didn't think I'd miss anything. And uh, it may have been my mood, but listening to you all, nope, I, I definitely had this film and understood it. It just wasn't funny, not particularly entertaining. Um, the backstory of the of the um, title character uh, is horribly tragic and uh, so there just wasn't any fun to be had here was there KI5 KWG back to net all right well very good you you enjoyed the film as well next up is Virginia NB5F uh, she's over in Fort Worth, and she saw part of the film. What did you, what did you think of the uh, the story from KE5 ICX? KE5 ICX in the nest. This is Virginia NV5F. Um, I didn't have a clue what was happening. I'll be honest. I had some curry that I'd made for supper, and that was tasting delicious. And... I had Search City on in the background, and um, I was kind of looking for and jonesing to find something to 3D print because I would rather have watched my 3D printer than this movie, and now I regret not just turning up Search City and listening to that with the sound from this turned down. Um, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, there was a spaceship. There was a android chick who didn't say very much there was a big fat dude with a mustache who looked like he'd been in a billion other crappy movies from the same era uh, there was a reference to Alien uh, which Spaceballs did a much better job with seven years later uh, there was 
a fake Star Wars cantina scene. There was some use of the theme from 2001. And so all I can gather is that this was a riff on every science fiction thing from the previous, um, I guess, about 15 or 20 years. And it had the, the typical uh, late 70s, early 80s, cheap, cheap science fiction movie feel to it. And uh, that's pretty familiar. Um, but, yeah, I the plot was to me non-existent and I will just honestly say I didn't finish the movie I had to get up early to go to Irving and so I just I, I bailed so yeah another another uh, uh, another glowing review from me uh, back to net in B5F <laughs> Yeah, I suspected that. Now, in in I, I in my defense, and I'm going to tell you something. I I have a tendency when when Brenda isn't uh, picking the movies, I'll go out and look through the movies for her. And in what what I find is is that I'll I'll, I'll look and I'll read a synopsis, a short synopsis of the of the movie. And I of course I'm looking for things that are streaming for free with advertisements or are in public domain or whatever, so you know already the films aren't going to be that good. Or they might be good, uh, just with uh, a commercial component to it that is added in, and you can watch the film as well. And then there's films that are older, and I've never seen this film before, so I didn't know what to expect either. So you just kind of close your eyes and do a little prayer and hope that the film will be entertaining. You never know exactly when it's going to be. I don't want to go and spoil it for myself when I want it to spoil it for me rather than me spoiling it. But it disappoints me rather than me being disappointed that I already know what the ending is going to be. So that's what I do. This film was one of those. I had heard of it. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, it hadn't really had much in the way of fandom, so I thought, well, oh, maybe it's just an obscure film. No, it's just terrible. That's, that's all, and nobody really cared about it. So that's, that's, that's pretty much what happened. I promise I will do less terrible movies if I can possibly help it. But you got to have this, you know. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And we, many of you are have Criterion strength because of motion pictures. You can watch anything, even my dinner with Andre, and be able to survive it simply because you have grown immune to horrible ones. And that's an important thing to keep in mind, everyone. You have made this happen. You have gone above and beyond the call of duty, and you have the, the, the constitution to be able to handle anything, anything at all, even Hallmark movies. All right, so with that, uh, I, have, I haven't mentioned anything about the movie yet, but I will. Uh, anyone else want to check in before I give my comments? Because you are important. Did you see this film? Uh, did you not see this film? Would you like to see this film? Would you just like to check in to let everybody know that you like movies, even bad ones, or you don't like bad ones and you like good ones? Uh, please come with your call, your name, and did you see Galaxina from 1980? I suspected crickets, and I fully get it. Okay, my comments on the movie. Yes, I agree. Pacing was really, really slow. I found that really difficult to, to handle. Uh, they, they brought in Avery Schreiber to, as Captain Cornelius Butt because Schreiber and mug for a camera, and he was very popular in the 60s and kind of had a short revival, I guess, in the 80s with this role. We saw him in the monitors and actually had a pretty darn good role as the innocent innocent human being having to deal with all of the monitors. That's where you may have remembered him recently and but he's done or did lots of commercials and television stuff in the sixties and seventies and was a character actor that most people enjoyed. 
And if you could just kind of brush away the, the ter- it's hard to put lipstick on this pig and expect it not to be a pig, and it was. Now, my thoughts on when you write something like this is, Science fiction is difficult enough as it is. I've made my comments about how, how it's difficult to do world building and get across the idea of some concept and storyline so that uh, the audience can follow it and appreciate it. Well, glue on top of that a comedy, and that becomes a very, very tall order. So what ends up happening with comedy is, is it becomes parody, and they try and parody other films of the same genre, and we know that's exactly what they did with this one. The problem is uh, multifold, and that is, is that you have to have something that the audience is familiar with, and I guess in reality they were. These were all blockbuster films that came out. But the, the other thing is, is how are you going to lampoon science fiction if you yourself don't know what it is? And if you're not very good at comedy and you're trying to do a film and you've sold this as a, you know, this, this storyline to producers and they're putting it out, even if it is a low-budget film, how the heck do you expect people to, to be able to follow it and enjoy it? And the answer is they don't. So many times these things fail. Now, Spaceballs was good, and most people found it really great. I, I was okay with it. I, it wasn't my favorite Mel Brooks film by any stretch. Uh, but I, I think that part of the problem is, 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 is uh, that you really have to understand the subject matter that you're lampooning. Science fiction is not that easy to follow. And as such, if you do the jokes, the jokes kind of fall flat. Or if you don't understand the concept of the film, the jokes are kind of mediocre. Uh, we just, we're just going to put a funny in there, you know. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't work. Now, what does work is, I think, with comedy, and this has happened, one of my favorite, a couple of TV series I like that are able to handle it is Futurama is very good at that, and then the uh, Star Trek vehicle called Lower Decks is very good at it. They lampoon their uh, genres very, very well. They understand it because they're fans. They are people that really enjoy science fiction, so they know all the ins and outs that's when it starts to be funny. But it will have a limited audience because those those type of uh, TV shows and movies, you've got to know why it's funny, uh, the background in it. Now, as an example, I enjoy Lower Decks uh, because of all the Star Trek stuff. And there, there's like a million Easter eggs in every minute of that show. And the more you know, say, Star Trek, the more jokes you can see in the background than overtly set. And it's really a lot, a lot of fun. Futurama's the same way. They, they go in and have taken and, and completely lampoon movies and TV series and all of that. But they do it in a very geeky sci-fi SF sort of way. And so it's funny to geeky, sci-fi, SF types. Uh, if you're not that, you're trying to go for the lowest common denominator, which is probably a nine-year-old, you're not going to be able to really make it happen. And that's exactly what I think happened with this film and why it fell flat. That and the terrible writing overall. So there you have it. That's my synopsis and why the, 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 the plot fell flat. It was very sophomoric, really, in the end. I think, uh, uh, was it Flesh Gordon I tried to watch one time. It was supposed to be a comedy thing. And I, I couldn't get through that film. I got about 15 minutes into it, and I just said, no, 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 no. Turned it off. So I've never seen the, the end of the film barely saw the beginning of the film. So that's another one that I will not assign for homework. Okay, so let me go to the top. That would be John, K5JDW. John, maybe still listening. John, you want to go see Galaxina with us sometime? From KE5ICX.
You see, even John gave up on us. I'm going to put a big X through his name. He checked in and then checked out. Boy. Okay, next up is uh, characterization. I have a feeling we're going to, just going to blow through this, this particular movie, but we'll find out. There have been some that were so bad we had an opportunity to shred it multiple times. So I'm going to start with Tony, NT5TM. Tony, what did you think of the characterization? It's about a dozen characters in this film. I'm sure you loved them all. But which ones did you love the most? From KE5ICX. Well, in real life, the character of Dorothy Stratton was, was pretty depressing. Uh, a young woman uh, just fallen upon by all these vultures of various ages, and one of them happened to have a shotgun, unfortunately. Uh, and, and that's far more interesting than any character in this movie. Uh, I guess they had names. I couldn't really mostly tell them apart. Uh, really, no comments. I'd, I'd like to keep the net going for longer because you're all my friends and I want you to have a good time. But I can't think of anything to say. <laughs> NT5 TM. Well, good. So you liked all the characters. Ordick was pretty good. And, uh, and uh, 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 Sam, who was Sam Wu, and the Rock Eater, and, and uh, Alexa, and, and Commander Garrity, who, who was only in it for a few seconds, and Sergeant Thor, and of course everybody loved Camellia, but all good stuff. Okay, very good. So I'm glad you, you went into great detail about each of the characters. Next up is Jay, KG5BZWJ. What did you think of characterization or even the acting on this fine film from KE5ICX? Five 
Yeah, this is KB nine S. Okay, um, their strengths, I, I guess, would be the fact that uh, they were willing to be a part of such a bad movie, <laughs> willing to risk their careers to promote this. <laughs> oh man, you know, I wish I could come up with some clever stuff uh, to keep you all entertained as well. But uh, this one's a tough one. I mean, a lot of times even with bad movies, it, it can be fun to rip on them some when they, you see that they actually tried. And, but this one here is just so slow and flat, and the characters were just so boring. I don't, it's not even fun to pick on them. It's, uh, yeah, no, no, we understand, Tom. They're not all going to be winter movies, and we understand. Uh, uh, once in a while, we do get some gems, and, and it's fun. Uh, and it's always interesting to see ones that uh, you didn't know existed, uh, even when they're mediocre. But, uh, yeah, this one was just a miss, unfortunately. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, I wish I could come up with something on this one, but yeah, they were all, probably the best character might have been when the credits, credits were rolling at the end. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they were all just very flat and boring and very stereotypical. They attempted to, to mock, you know, like, you, you, you really, you said it best. You've got to understand the content, and they did it when they wrote this. So there wasn't a whole lot the actors could do, because there just was just horrible writing. Um. So like you said, Lower Dex is an excellent example of how it can be done right. Uh, Speed Drama as well, I agree. Those are both very funny shows and do it very well. Um, but you're right, it, it's a very niche. Uh, there's a friend of mine that just recently I talked him in to watching Lower Dex because he's a huge Star Trek fan. And uh, he, he said he found it amusing, but he, he's struggling with it a little bit because like you said, you've really got to know the ins and outs to get some of the back end jokes. And if, if the show's written really well, it, it can be fun. But uh, unfortunately, this one was not. Um, unfortunately, comedies a lot of times are overlooked. Uh, people don't realize just how difficult it is to write something like that. And everybody's humor is so different um, that sometimes it's really hard to write something that's going to please many people. Uh, and sometimes on some movies, they try to keep the jokes very generic and, and, and hoping that it'll kind of hit on all audiences. And I think that's partly what they maybe tried to do here, but the, it just was bad because it didn't work as, even for just general old-fashioned fart jokes. Or it definitely didn't work for sci-fi uh, either. So and they kind of missed on both. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it is something difficult. So and to just uh, blowing over it, I'll send it back to that. KB9, that's okay. Hey, thank you, Sean. Uh, now, I, I, it just it came to me, I was trying to think, running through my mental Rolodex of films that were science fiction comedies that really did work, and some people would disagree with me, but I, I particularly liked Fifth Element. I find that film eminently rewatchable because the acting is over the top with good casting and a good, sto good story that's actually quite fun uh, with... Uh, I, I think some really good direction along the way. Uh, actors who don't traditionally do comedy do a really, really excellent job, and the whole thing comes together really well. But there are a lot of people who do not like that movie at all. So that, as you say, the comedic sensibilities, people have different, different expectations in comedy, and God knows what you think the expectations will be in a science fiction comedy. And I think that it is further parsed out with uh, opposite sides, uh, 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 you know, taking opposite sides with a film that, that uh, you know, made an honest efforts but may have failed for half your audience or more, but worked for others. And I think that's part of the reason how, how cult classics come about. There's also films that come about that don't always, you know, quite fit the mode, like uh, Buckaroo Banzai, and uh, that is loved by a lot of people. It's a comedy, but it's not a comedy. I mean, it, it, it is and it isn't. It's, it's a lighthearted uh, adventure of sorts, and that one works really well for me, but there are people that hate that movie as well. Okay, I'm out of turn. I'm moving on. Let me go to Cruz, KI5KWG. Cruz, what did you think of the characterization to me for Galaxina from 1980?
I'm going to put an asterisk by his name. I think he's out there, but he may have run off. Maybe maybe went outside for a little fresh air. Uh, we need it. Uh, next up is Virginia. I'll come back to Cruz in a bit. NV5F, Virginia, what do you think of the uh, characterizations and acting in Galaxina? K5ICX in the net, this is Virginia, NV5F. Well, like the plot, I didn't pay a lot of attention. Um, it did have that trying too hard to be funny feeling and juxtaposed with, you know, people. My, my take on characters is you have to care about them. And uh, if you can't establish within the first three minutes of a movie something to care about in the characters, uh, in, in most cases, then that you know, plot is character, character is action. Um, you have to care about what they want, why they want it, and I didn't even know what they wanted or why I was even watching. Um, but you you know, you brought up other things I'd like to talk about. Uh, a couple of different movies uh, and science fiction comedies. I think science fiction comedy. There's a lot of great ones. We cite Spaceballs a lot, I think, because, number one, it was Mel Brooks. He was very popular. Number two, he riffed on Star Wars, which is very widely known. Even if you didn't get the Planet of the Apes jokes and the 2001 jokes and the, all the more esoteric jokes in Spaceballs, you could get 90% you of the jokes just if you'd seen, you know, the three Star Wars movies. That was all you, and then that was like 90% of the people. So I think that's why that movie did so well. Also, that movie had a very simple plot, and it was, you know, the characters were based loosely on Star Wars characters, and regardless of that fact, they were, they in their own right were characters you could care about. You know, even the, even Dark Helmet and, you know, Barf the Dog, I mean, they're just people that, they were so well played and so well written you could care about them even the villains you know pizza the hut and you know president screw but you know they're just they had something lovable about them um and uh my favorite i think science fiction comedy is galaxy quest and that was based on a wide broad knowledge by the general public of star trek the next generation because it was the version of Star Trek that was the most appealing to the most people all at one time. Um, it had a little bit of something for everybody, and uh, it was the, the model they used, the, the first run syndication model was new, and it worked, and that became appointment television for a lot of people who weren't science fiction people. Um, I think the Orville does it way better than Lower Decks. Uh, I tried to watch Lower Decks, and I thought it was crude and gratuitous, and I think that Star Trek, even going all the way back to the original series and the original series crew movies, Star Trek does a much better job at just making fun of itself. By the time you get to Deep Space Nine and Star Trek Voyager and Enterprise, they're making so much fun of themselves and it's so well done right within, you know, a regular Star Trek episode. It's so much funnier. Um, and they, the, but the commonality is that the, the, you care about the characters, even if you don't like some of them very much, you know, you care about them. And that's what characterization is all about. And I didn't care about anybody in this movie this week. And so I just, wasn't paying a whole lot of attention so I think I got to say most of the things I wanted to say about sci-fi comedy um, there uh, there's some good stuff out there but a lot of it's really bad because like you said Tom science fiction if you try to make fun of stuff that's too esoteric and that's all you do um, and you don't have something like Star Wars or Star Trek uh, as you're jumping off point and you, you don't stick to kind of one thing you're making fun of and throw a few other little things in there. The thing, I did not like 
I had, did not like Buck Grew Bonsai at all. It was it was too broad. It was kind of like Galaxina. It didn't have any characters that I cared about. It didn't have a plot. I didn't I didn't care about the hero. I didn't care about the heroine. I I just I I tried to like it because a friend of mine that I really care about recommended it to me, and I just found it the parts where you know it's trying to be funny where it kind of it kind of felt like Galaxina but not quite as you know just not as bad so anyway I'll set up now uh, back to net K5 ICX in V5F okay thank you Virginia and and you proved my point I think that you know uh, to me I love Buckaroo Bonsai I could watch it a million times but it 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 is, a, you know, an unusual humor, and it, 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 the, the, you know, science fiction premise to it is a bit convoluted. But what I liked about it was that they just heaped one thing onto another uh, that was silly and the ridiculousness of it, and everybody named, uh, you know, uh, big, uh, uh, everybody, oh, uh, oh, God, I can't remember what everybody was named. I'll think of it. Uh, John, I think. Uh, that sort of thing. It was just kind of cute to me, but I can see how it could be extremely annoying to other people that, and, and, and really not all that funny. But to me, it was just kind of a shifting gears and, and kind of letting it roll a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I remember from, uh, I think it was from a Futurama episode, which I thought was kind of fun, is there's a trial. They have a trial. It's a space trial. And anybody who's watched any space trial, whether it be Star Trek or Deep Space Nine or even Lost in Space, and it, whatever it is, the tribunal, whatever it is, the space law thing is just horrible. None of it ever makes any sense. It's obviously written by people who are not lawyers, and as such, it comes off as really weird. And one of the things they did in it is, is whenever somebody came up and said, I object, and they put out some ridiculous comment about uh, something that said and, and some part of the evidence, the judge would always say, well, then I'll accept it, and they accept the evidence. And it's some really ridiculous thing. And you just go, oh, they do that on all the other shows, too. So that's an example. It's somewhat atmospheric, as you say. Uh, that, you know, I picked up on it immediately because space drama, space law things are really stupid. And Futurama was focusing on that fact. But would the audience get that in a big movie? Mm, I don't think so. And so would anybody who would write for it, who's not really super into science fiction and just trying to make a buck here and there, would they do anything like that? No. I have always thought making comedy is very, very difficult, even under the best of circumstances, but throwing uh, science fiction at it makes it even worse or more difficult to do. So uh, that's, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. All right, we're going to go to the third round. We do have time. We may just pull through this. I don't know. But it will uh, start at the top of the list. Anything you want to say about the film, uh, or any other film, if you want to compare and contrast, uh, that's fine by me. Whatever you want to do, or if you got a suggestion for next week or in the future, you can give me that as well. Anything you want to say about this movie, or anything else you want to say, here's your opportunity. We'll start with uh, Tony, NT5TM. Tony, hi. The floor is yours. combination of my luggage. Oh wait, wrong movie. Yeah, you know, there's so much. It is hard to make a great comedy, but that's part of why we revere them so much. Whether it's, you know, Buster Keaton in a speeding locomotive, or uh, My Name is Frankenstein, uh, yeah. or even just movies that have a lot of drama in them, but are, you know, have comedic elements, like uh, with Ghostbusters. But when you can make the world laugh, you've, you've done a fine thing. The world is full of horror and disaster and, and you know, all sorts of things that go wrong in every possible way, from the big to the small, and then you make us all laugh. You've done a good job. 
And I guess in that sense we can praise this movie a little bit because it made us all sleepy. But, you know, you can do that with alcohol or a blow to the head or, or just by staying awake too long. So, no achievement here, really nothing else to add except I, I wanted to order someone to change the combination to my luggage. NT5TM. Thank you, Tony. You made me laugh. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four. That's got to be what it is. Okay. Next up, uh, Jay. Jay, your final parting comments for our fine film for this week. KE5 ICX. about this film is a there's, there's aspects to it which I thought were played out uh, I'm not even sure this 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 may be just some weird jump I'm making in my head and not really something that logically follows but the the uh, comedy Red Dwarf um, there were a little bit of aspects which I, I wondered if you know The Red Dwarf wasn't drawing a little bit from this film. Um, I, not really. It, it, it just... I, I felt like Red Dwarf did what this film uh, wanted to do, but a whole lot better. Granted, it wasn't a, it wasn't a film. It was, it was a bunch of a TV series, so they had lots of little episodes. And, um, I like the humor in it. Um... Um, as far as, at least the ones I've seen on, you know, PBS, and you know, there were only, like, a, a few episodes that they, they liked to, to show, so I don't know, uh, to be honest with you, around, I, I can't judge on the whole series, because I only, I can only make the judgment on the, the few that uh, were apparently uh, good enough to, to be uh, broadcast on PBS, um, on, uh, I mean, the local K KERA, um, but, uh, the, the special effects were, you know, okay, I guess. I like the, 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 the interaction with the, the masked, uh, or wh whatever, uh, individual in the, the Falcon, uh, craft. I thought the, the Falcon craft was actually kind of decent, too, uh, there was aesthetics in this that were kind of interesting and um, kind of, well, uh, just like an alien's, uh, uh, um, oh, I forget the artist, <laughs> the grotesque and almost, well, I know I won't say almost, but I, 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 it, it broaches on topics I, I hate to, to, to get into in, in, on ham radio. <laughs> um, but the, the art style of, of the artist that, that was behind Alien, um, it kind of seemed to, 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 to draw a little bit on that, but not really. I mean, oh, I, I, I like the word to describe. It. Let's just say it, it's not quite. It, it, it was the same as that, but there is there's. Certain qualities that were kind of like that, and not in the aesthetics or whatnot, but in, in what they were referring to. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, otherwise, I don't know. If that's what I can say. Get you five pieces of me. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for your comments this evening. Next up, Sean, KB5SOK. Uh, Sean, any final comments, parting shots for tonight's movie, Galaxina, from KE5ICX? Yeah, this is KB9SOK. 
Uh, not a whole lot to add. Um, you know, the special effects, you know, I, I really didn't find them all that special. They, they, they were, you know, I realized this was low budget, but they were probably not even on par with TV shows at the time. Um, but, you know, we've seen even worse on that part, so I guess maybe <laughs> a little, uh, maybe a half a star on special effects. Uh, music, nothing really special other than when they played the theme to 2001. Um, you know, obviously that was recognizable. Uh, other than that, not a whole lot as far as the way it was filmed or anything really all that special. Uh, I'll just say I appreciate the other examples uh, that everybody's brought up as other comedies that were much better. It makes me want to watch some of those <laughs> again. Um, so yeah, just as usual, just to enjoy always listening to the net. And uh, if you're listening, uh, Brenda, I hope you feel better soon. And uh, you're back to net, KB9, that's okay. Oh, thank you, Sean. And yeah, I'll, I'll thank everybody. We keep coming back and doing these. Yeah, I know there's some pretty bad films, but we always find something to talk about. And you know, I, I think that's the best part of it. And in the end, you end up appreciating good films more, and you can understand why some films just go horribly off off the rails and become the horror classics that they were never intended to be. So, you know, that that's part of the fun. And as I've always said, I don't make it a secret. This is my favorite net. I really do enjoy it. I takes a lot of work to put Skynet together, but I and I enjoy it a lot. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it for 12 years. But and and thanks to everybody who who contributes their time and their effort to make that happen. This one doesn't take a lot of time and effort to do, except watching the film. But I still enjoy it a lot because I enjoy the com uh, the conversations and I always glean something out of a, a you know comments that people have made that I didn't get before, even if the film is terrible. If it's great and I get something new out of it, so much the better, a real bonus. So that's why I enjoy these nets. And I, I take a two-hour nap in the afternoon just so I can stay up because I don't last much past 9 o'clock except on Saturday evening. All right, next up, uh, let's try again. Uh, Cruise, KI5KWG, are you out there? Got some comments, final comments for us on this fine film from KE5ICX. That's interesting. Usually we have them for the evening. Uh, must have maybe something happened to the radio. I, I know I've I've actually fallen asleep in my own net. So being net control, I disappeared once. And I think this was the net, and it was after a, a an event like this uh, where we had uh, during the day. It might even have been after uh, uh, Irving Hamfest one time where it, I think it was indeed the afterglow net, and I fell asleep and didn't wake up and for a couple hours and I was just laid here in this chair and didn't quite make it. So I don't know. It can happen. All right. Well, we'll, we'll have to ask Cruz what happened to him. Next up, uh, last but certainly not least, the Virginia and V5F. What uh, parting shot comments do you want to make on our fine film for tonight? KE5ICX. KE5ICX in V5F. Hi, this is Virginia and um, well, I will tell you that I did attempt to do my due diligence after our little coming to Jesus meeting today at the Hamfest. Um, I did attempt to watch this film in its entirety uh, this evening before TechNet, and when I went to follow the link to the content, it said... Uh, the Tubi channel said, content unavailable. I also went over to, I was sitting in my chair, all comfortable, and I was watch, I was going to watch it on my phone, and then I said, well, maybe it's the mobile something, and so I went over to the desktop computer and did the same thing, and I also got content unavailable. I took that as a sign that I was off the hook, so, um... So that is the reason why I haven't had a whole lot of detail to say about the movie, but 
it brings up a very good topic, which is science fiction comedy. And then Jay brought up Red Dwarf, which then, of course, made me think of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which has had several incarnations. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's an interesting topic. Maybe we should watch weeks. I think that would be worth some discussion. Um, anyway, so even though the movie sucked, the conversation was great, and um, the topic was a good one, and it's definitely uh, something I enjoy talking about. So, uh, oh, and if we ever do short circuit, I'll be happy to run the net that night because I'd like to just sit back and hear what everybody has to say. Anyway, uh, thanks, Tom for a fun net as usual and it was good to see everybody at the ham fest today uh good night to all this is nb5f well thank you virginia thanks for the comments and yes you can have uh you can have uh the net for short circuit i'll tell you what i'll give you a homework assignment uh what i typically do is i comb through the video streaming sites that uh, common ones uh, and look for freebies such as short circuit. Now, I will tell you this, and I was about to mention this anyway, but but uh, it's sometimes difficult when you get a, a popular movie that people actually want to watch. Uh, they don't last very long on the streaming services, particularly the free ones. Uh, they may last a few weeks, maybe a month, maybe three weeks. So sometimes I'll, I'll uh, schedule a movie. For example, I wanted to do Starman for next week, and it's already gone. It's gone already. I, I, it, it's, the first, uh, it's the first week of the month, and it ended, I guess, last month. And sometimes even in the middle of the month that happened. And I, uh, as, as people were talking here, I was going back and checking links for next week's movie and, and all of that to make sure everything worked. And I found a couple of popular movies in here that I wanted to actually watch are already gone. So it is really difficult to uh, stay faithful with some of the newer films unless you just simply say, that day, next week we'll be watching this and make sure that the link works and still know that next week it may disappear. And it's all legit. It's not like it's some Russian site or something like that. It can be Tubi. Tubi is a real good one for that. They'll run for a few weeks of movie, and then it's gone. And that's not unusual at all. Pluto TV is another one that does exactly the same thing. Okay, uh, nothing else to add on this particular film. I think I already made my comments, and I did some of them out of order, so I won't bore you with that. Next week's movie, actually, I did put a date to this thing. Uh, I was going to put Starman up front of it, but it's gone, so we're going to go with what we originally planned. And this one is called, uh, it's from a, a, a series called the Librarian series. I don't know much about it. I think I saw one of them. Uh, this is back in the 2000s. But uh, this one uh, is on 2B TV. It's called The Librarian Curse of the Judas Chalice from 2008. So that'll be next week's movie. I hope it's good. At least it'll be decent quality. It won't be blurry vision like it was this week. I hope you enjoy it. I hope I enjoy it, too. I hope we all enjoy it. So um, I'll keep a lookout for Short Circuit. Virginia, you do the same. We'll look. Uh, I've got notes here. I always am happy when people suggest films, and I'll put them in the reserve list in hopes that they'll show up sometimes. So I'll just keep looking until they show so I say 7-3 to everybody. It's great to see everybody today, too. Thanks very much for coming out. This is sort of like uh, Easter time when you do uh, the Irving Ham Fest. These are people you see only once a year a lot of times. You hear them on the radio, but you actually get to talk to them, and I, I love that. That's always my favorite event uh, for the ham radio, even above field day, because you get to see people from different clubs, different places, different areas, and it, it, it really is a lot of fun. It's like Easter uh, when everybody ends up going to church the same day. Well, this is going to church for ham radio people. Say 7-3, see you all next week. This is KE5 ICX and Clear. Bye-bye.